Hey there, Father Michael here. We're coming up on the 14th anniversary of my ordination to transitional deacon coming up in August. 14 years, it seems <laughs> kind of hard to believe. Uh, and when I think of that day, I think of, number one, no air conditioning in the church <laughs> because, I don't know, it just, it failed. And so it was hot and miserable. And I am uh, lying on the floor in my alb, which is the white robe. And I am like sobbing into the carpeting. And I have so much snot coming out of my <laughs> nose because the bishop who is uh, giving, uh, who had just given a reflection, a little sermon, uh, like just unleashed the floodgates of emotion within me. And so I'm, I'm prostrate on the floor and I am like covered with snot and, and I have no Kleenex and I have to get up soon and approach, uh, the bishop, uh, who's going to lay hands on me. And, and I'm in a, I'm in a little bit of a distracted panic because I know that there's this pile of boogers <laughs> on my face. Um, and thank God, one of the female priests uh, in the sanctuary, when I started to get up, she realized <laughs> that I was in crisis and she came running over with a handful of Kleenex so I could get my, my life together, get myself uh, cleaned up to go through that ordination process. <clears throat> Despite that humorous uh, part, I also remembering, I'm remembering an overwhelming sense of connection and calling and, and feeling like I was right there achieving my destiny. I had known since I was eight years old just before I made my first Holy Communion, that I was meant to be a priest. I knew that. I knew that was gonna happen. It did not happen, however, in any way that I could have predicted or foreseen at that time. I thought it was going to happen for a while when I was uh, working in, in one of the Byzantine churches. These are Eastern Orthodox churches that have uh, come back into the Roman, uh, the Roman tent, if you will, under the authority of the Bishop of Rome, AKA the Pope. And so I, I'm there and I'm part of a, a Ukrainian um, congregation. I'm not Ukrainian, but, you know, they keep reassuring me, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, we love you, we want you. Um, and I was the golden boy for, for a long time, the better part of a decade, I would say. All of Eastern Christian worship is chanted, and so <clears throat> the cantor really is the one who controls the destiny of the musical <laughs> evolution of that worship service because he has to be, and it's always a he, he has to always be mindful of what the congregational range is and most challenging, try to keep that pastor on key. Man, sometimes that is a struggle. I remember doing a funeral one time where you know, the priest, uh, the cantor sets it up for the priest. So if I end, uh, let's say, on a C, he knows what his starting note is. He's going to start 
honesty. I like I you set it up for him, right? You like gift it to him. Well, this guy, whew, I don't know what he was hearing, but he was always up a major third. And so we're getting higher. And, and the thing is that I pick up where he leaves off, right? Oh my goodness. It was just ridiculous. It was like a soprano screeching thing. And then finally I had to just stop and start over and go back down, down the scale. And he apologized to the whole congregation because everybody was like, what's happening here? <laughs> Who is this priest? Anyway, that's the struggle of being a cantor in the Eastern, uh, in Eastern Christianity. The bottom line was I was like the golden boy. Everybody loved me. The people loved me. Most of the clergy loved me. But the hierarchy was still trapped and to this day is trapped in that ethnicity factor. So they were quite willing to accept my services for big worship events uh, because, man, I can hold my own musically any day of the week. They were, they were down with that. And they would feed me just enough hope, a few crumbs of hope to keep me going, keep me coming back because they wanted that, you know, wanted my musical talents uh, to be used. Unfortunately, besides the ethnicity issue, there is a lot of sexism. <clears throat> There's a lot of homophobia, even though, like all the Catholic churches, a lot of the clergy is gay. I'm guessing at least 60%. When my son died, though, I've, I've literally finally convinced the bishop to ordain me a uh, deacon. And then my son died. And I had a real existential crisis. Who am I? What am I doing? What's my life now as a father with a deceased child? It's a real mind-bending experience, I gotta tell you. So I deselected myself from that whole process. And, you know, I just wasn't gonna let it happen because I couldn't be part of something that was so mm, sexist and homophobic and all of that. It wasn't a real fit for who I, who I really am. So, <sighs> years go by. I had already decided, as I thought about what this ministry would look like, that I was not going to be a career pastor. You know, there's something kind of scandalous about a pastor that is making a lot of money, living in million dollar uh, mansions and has a fleet of high end uh, automobiles at his disposal. There's something not quite Jesus-like about that whole thing. In the 1940s, there was a movement in France the, the worker priest movement. And so I had already been attracted to that idea. And so my plan was I was going to continue to support myself and work in the world, you know, in quotes, as we say, and not take any income from the Catholic parish that I would found. So, like I said, I was coming to some clarity in some areas, but some of my best laid plans were not working out. I tried a few tactics and avenues to try and force, really, my destiny to unfold. But it wasn't until 2006 that it all finally, kind of organically, naturally, Coincidentally, if you believe in coincidences, and I'm not sure I do, anyway, coincidentally, naturally, it all seemed to fall into place. And there I was. There I was. Ready to go. Ready to do my thing. And I remember sitting in the empty church of my childhood on Christmas morning, 
2006 and feeling again that certainty of my call and feeling that the powerful urge within me to become a priest just like I had when I was eight years old. And so I said simply to God, tearfully I might add, okay, you know I want to give in to this, but you're just gonna have to make this happen for me because I've tried everything I know how to do and nothing has worked. I don't know a whole lot as a senior citizen, but I do know that whenever we try to like plan out our life or arrange our life uh, using our own cleverness and our, our connections and our own powers of persuasion and politicking, doesn't work. We're so distracted that we can't be fully attentive to what God is telling us. It's not like God is, you know, on vacation and not talking to us and making us wait. It's not that. The answer is always right there in front of us. We need to just shut the hell up and listen and stop trying to fool ourselves into thinking that we can just do what we need to do, pull some strings, try to, you know, be the puppet master of our destiny. That I know is true. And so here we are 14 years later, coming up on that anniversary of ordination to transitional deacon. And then, you know, in late October, priesthood ordination. I have not regretted that decision, truthfully. Now, I have spent sleepless nights worrying about it, how it was all going to work out. I have spent a lot of time going down the rabbit hole, especially late at night when I can't sleep, wondering, you know, about my own worthiness, my own abilities to pull this pull this ministry thing off to as well as my own motivations you know have I have I perhaps bamboozled myself into thinking God wanted me to do this when really it was just my own ego hard places to be in the middle of the night to be sure but today at least I'm thinking it's all good. Am I worthy? No, not any more worthy than anybody else. Do I have the ability to pull this off to make this ministry work? Okay, probably, but not any more than anybody else. I do believe my motivations are pure. And that counts for something, I think. The key for each of us, particularly those of us who are called to be pastors, is to simply entrust the future to God, to not obsess over the details of exactly how this is supposed to go, you know, and to stop trying to control every tiny step along the way. Entrusting tomorrow to God, which sounds like a hard thing, but actually isn't, is something that we all need to do. Just let go of tomorrow. It will take care of itself, as Jesus tells us. And if we can put all of that worry and stress aside we find all of a sudden we have a lot of room on our plate so we can start taking in some, some clarity and a little peace of mind and just keep doing the right thing. 
book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5, says, Trust in God with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. Good words for each one of us, especially for us pastors who think somehow that we might just be a wee bit more special. Let's pray. God of our present moment and of our future, you have placed deep within each one of us a yearning for connection with you. Help us today to put aside all of our scheming and planning and stressing about the future and help us to simply, as best we can, turn it over to you, to choose to trust in you with all our heart and to set aside our own cleverness and our own planning and all of that so that we might attend to your still speaking voice within us. For all of the times that you have guided us through uncertainty, we thank you. We thank you. Help us then to remember those times and to simply trust. Amen. Have a great start to the week.